It's a pleasure to be here. I've had a chance to talk to several of you uh, once, about a month ago, and I discovered that uh, we can have something that's more interactive than usually in French communities. So uh, let's try it. The, uh, the, I have one plea. I had COVID uh, a few months ago, and ever since, I'm half deaf. I haven't had time to uh, get things put into my ears and so forth. So when you ask questions or when you make comments, and please do, shout. <laughs> I can... Uh, I can give it a try. Uh, this talk is, uh, is not exclusively about French nuclear. The reason uh, will probably be very apparent uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, what I'm trying to, uh, to convey is an idea a very simple idea. The first thing is uh, energy policies cannot today be separate from climate change problems. It's obvious. When, you're, uh, when you move, you use energy. When a society moves, when a society develops this or that type of industry, of uh, agriculture and so forth, it uses energy, it transforms energy actually. It transforms energy in ways that depend on the sort of industry you're using, the sort of uh, agriculture you're using and so forth. And the, uh, the, the gist of the story is that the two are inseparable and when you change society, or when society is changed under external stress, which is the system that is beginning, that has been beginning for the last 10 years or so to affect our societies, it's going to change the way we use energy. It's already true today. I'm not talking exclusively about markets, but it also, you can read it also in the markets, but you can read it in daily life. The, uh, it also applies, of course, among the various energies that you can talk about, it also applies to nuclear energy. That's the first idea. Coevolution of energy, coevolution of energy with society, and where does the arrow go? The main arrow is society determines energy use and the way you use it and also the type you use and also the speed at which you can change it because it works also in the other direction uh, you're using a type of energy if the type of energy is such that it it brings a, with it uh, for example, think of oil or gas. Once you have gas, gas is extraordinarily convenient and it's extraordinarily powerful. The, the energy content of gas is very high. So when people developed cars, it was first simply the most reasonable, the cleverest way to use gas. And then there's a lock-in because cars are useful for many reasons that I don't have to go into. And your society is locked in to the use of cars until, for some reason, external rather than internal, unfortunately, you find that you're going to have to change the type of energy that you're going to use because you want to develop railroads or so forth. That's the, the, the main idea that I'd like to set in the background of my talk 
uh, for a starter, society determines energy and energy has a not so secondary effect of being able to lock in a type of society <coughs> and a type of uh, relations inside the society. We're going to apply that to nuclear power in a minute. The second idea I'd like to emphasize before I start is nuclear power even more than oil or gas is a matter of history. It has a history and the history it has is not something that you put away once you've read a book on uh, how uh, it's been developed initially and you leave the rest to historians. No, nuclear history, past history, is with us every day. And that's going to be one of the main topics of my talk. And the other thing, which I think will be obvious to everybody, is nuclear is politics. And nuclear is highly politics. There are some consequences for various countries and those consequences are very specifically emphasized in the French situation today. So France is sort of a prime example of the problem. It's unfortunately not a prime example of the solution. And that's something we'll be talking about at the end, maybe, in, in a discussion between us. First idea, what's going on now? You've probably seen figures like that, have you? Yes. So you understand what I'm talking about. This is greenhouse gases rising. The red arrow there is showing the time lag we have to change and adapt. Adapt is the magic word. It's magic in the sense that you don't really know how to, how to do the adaptation. But, the, but you know that you have to adapt. We have to adapt to the effect of climate change. How much time do we have? We have 10 years to get down by 30% of the uh, greenhouse gas production uh, excess and about 50, until 2050 to, uh, to be at zero uh, balance. That's a very short time. Can humanity manage to adapt over that time? You've had talks on that, I think. And uh, the, uh, the reference that you've probably heard already is that the last time this adaptation was needed because of climate change was about 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, and uh, it took about 20,000 years to do the adaptation. And this time we have 10 to 30 years. So we have a problem that is not a small problem. It is highly political, highly economic, and so forth, and it is absolutely determined by the fact that we can bring a sufficient portion of society with us, us, the people who realize how urgent it is, bring everybody along, which means that we have to fight against inequalities because some people don't want to change simply because they don't know where they're going. I'm talking about the, the, the poorest part of humanity. And some people don't want to change because they're very comfortable the way they are. And we have to have enough we have to have enough people to bring along to do this adaptation over a period that is very short. And that uh, as a conclusion, uh, we'll be talking about that. To come back to, uh, to the speed at which climate change is, uh, is affecting us, I don't know if you've seen this picture because uh, this one just came out uh, about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, an enlargement of what I showed previously. This is the speed on the, on the right, the black arrow, horizontal arrow you have, 
is what the IPCC projected in 220 on the, on the right here, the, uh, this here. This was the speed that was needed at the time, suggested at the time by the IPCC and people around the IPCC working on the speed at which technically it had to be done. In the meantime, the real change, instead of going down like this, was going this way, and it keeps on going this way, as you've heard, uh, even in the news this morning. And since we've lost just two or three years, then here, now we're here in terms of speed. We're here around right here instead of being here to go down to zero. So the changes we're talking about are simply because the increment of greenhouse gas uh, production is maintained. We have even less time than we anticipated to solve the problem. So the urgency is pretty clear, I suppose. Those are examples. I don't want to go into detail, but I just wanted to show you this. Don't miss this. Fossil fuel subsidies this year have gone up to 1,000 trillion uh, euros or dollars, as you want. The subsidies to keep on producing oil in areas of the world where it's uh, the most dangerous for the population and for the future. And these are the changes in ocean temperature, acidity, the ice, uh, the ice shelf. You've probably heard that the ice shelf is melting four times faster than, the, uh, than expected from the initial uh, models. So the problem is really serious. The problem is a matter of, it comes from outside, that's what we call physical forcing. You have physical forces that you can't do anything about. You're incre well, you can stop increasing the temperature, but other than that, once you've increased the, uh, the greenhouse gas content, you're going to increase the temperature. And the instabilities and the alteration of, uh, uh, of the planet are going to come out essentially independent of of uh, what you decide once you've put in a certain amount of greenhouse gases. It'll change geography, it'll change biodiversity, population, distribution. People are not going to live in the same places. For example, there will no longer be Bordeaux wine, things like that. You're smiling, but uh, I think that one way in which people will be realizing what's happening will be that. And these things are uh, to be kept in mind because it's not just a matter of uh, hard facts. It's also a matter of convincing uh, our fellow humans that we have to change fast. Adaptation means major societal changes. And you have a list of questions there to which I don't think anybody knows the answer today. What do we do know is that society will not be the same in a few years. And a few years may be five years, it may be 10 years, but it's not, it can't be more than 10 years. We can't live in the same society because if we, do, if we, uh, if we let greenhouse gases continue, uh, some people near the seashore, some people in uh, areas that are... Paris will be as warm as Algiers in uh, about 10 years, whatever we do actually, with the amount of greenhouse gases uh, we already have. You can't live in the same society because the society has to change to adapt to that. So either it adapts mechanically pushed from outside or we do something about it and help it to get an evolution that is livable, for one, 
and also perhaps less dangerous and less uh, problematic than the one we have today. Production models, well, you won't, you won't be growing the same things, you won't be producing the same things, you won't be building an industry in the same way and so forth, and uh, you also have the problem of where you're going to put them. You can't, for example, put a nuclear uh, plant on the seashore to be able to cool the, uh, the, the inside of the plant. You won't be able to do that because the seashore is being eaten away. So the plants that are today on the seashore, particularly in northern France, and you hear that on the radio these days, uh, the, the seashore is being eaten away by the, uh, by the sea. And the plant will have to move back. And they're not easy to move. And you're not going to build another identical plant a few kilometers away. So you're going to change the world. And of course, the uh, ways in which exchange and transport will be modified are also going to be important. So, to summarize, a society structure will have to be adapted. Can it be productivist? Can it be as it is today, as, as we hear every morning, every, we hear all day? Let's manage to make it sustainable in the sense that we can continue in the same way we were working before, but changing a few knobs so that it is sustainable. Is that possible? The development, it, once you try to adapt, are going to determine the energy distribution. Are you going to focus on uh, concentrated sites which produce energy and distribute them? which is the, typically the French model, in which everything goes through Paris, basically. So, and then it goes out. Uh, the, uh, the grid in most highly industrial countries works in the same way. You have some sort of centralization, not always, but often, some sort of centralization, and then you redistribute. So it also has a... a <clears throat> A political character. Your son. Yes, sorry. Ah. Um, yes, I will shout. Yeah, okay. thank you. <laughs> when you talk uh, about this, I honestly I'm freaking out a little bit. But, oh my God. <laughs> but then do I shout in the mic? Yes, you can shout in the mic. <laughs> okay, I'm right. sorry for the oh, I can, I can hear I, you. I'm then. sorry for the people on Zoom. But, um, I guess I, I can feel my body reacting to what you're saying and it makes me really anxious. And then I'm, I'm wondering, do you encounter outside of natural sciences the, the urgency that you vocalize here to us? Because I, I don't feel like I'm living in this reality, if you understand what I mean. I think I understand what you mean. In the next 10 years, hmm. I don't think I'm actually living according to that knowledge of course you're not of course you're not i mean it, it's a it's a change it's a very basic change it's it, it's the comparison i made before uh, last time it happened humanity there weren't many humans around but there were some they had ten thousand years to adapt and we have half a lifetime at best and and I'm not saying I'm not saying it's uh, I'm not saying uh, many people realize it, and I think one of the reasons why the the discussion is so difficult, the uh, the discussion turns into what Americans like to call a conversation, and a conversation it, it, the the word is very interesting because the conversation says that we're just talking about it. No, we're not talking about it. We're living, we're, we are already living it, and it's going to get worse in, in, a, in one sense and more interesting in another sense, because this adaptation is not going to be something that will be 
available uh, that you can take off a shelf. It's something that people will have to fight for, fight to change themselves, fight to change the society around them. Fighting doesn't mean you're going in the streets and, uh, and taking a gun and, uh, and shooting around. It means that this, this discussion has to take place in a way that you can group people, a majority of society, and that's called democracy. That's the sort of thing you do when you get people together, make them discuss, put things on the table, and uh, start trying to understand everybody's point of view, and try not to go make a medium, a sort of half-baked solution. No, solve the problem together. An example, uh, transportation. I mean, we're in a situation that is completely crazy where Tesla makes supercars that cost extraordinarily, that are extraordinarily expensive for a majority of people who don't need them. And you have a majority of people who need cars to go short distances. And they need cars today. But if they had trains, if they had means of communications, if they had more bicycles in many cases, uh, and bicycles that cost less, things could, you could adapt. There are small adaptations such as those, and there are large adaptations on the industrial scale and so forth. Did I answer your, or did I go along with your, uh, with your worries? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I guess from a personal point of view, I was wondering if you, if you feel that somewhere there is this sense of urgency. Like if somebody feels respect to this. Not enough. Maybe Clearly the, not enough. Maybe the 58 degrees Celsius in Rio today. Yeah. Uh, spring time is. Yeah. Definitely. So, to come back to, to, to the point I was making before, uh, energy power society and in turn the type of energy we use has also an effect that can be very, uh, very uh, important at some times uh, to lock in a type of society. And and it's political. Think of, uh, I don't know how many of you have followed this, but there was, there was an incident that was extremely interesting and, and I think very significant. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, There's a, an institution or a, a grouping of the major industrial uh, uh, owners, the, uh, the businessmen in France called MEDEF and they had a they have an annual meeting and they invited uh, Jean Jouzel who is one of the uh, authors of the IPCC report and they also invited well, he was a member of it of course the uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Total Total the uh, oil and uh, gas uh, producer and, uh, and uh, developer who are right now developing or beginning to develop a huge project in Africa in a, in a primal, primal forest. You've probably heard about that. It's an enormous project and, uh, and it has an impact that, that is absolutely drastic on, uh, on the people around and on the world in fact because the primal forest is one of the pumps for uh, greenhouse gases, particularly CO2. And Jouzel was explaining the problems that uh, I was talking about. And the answer of, uh, of Pouyanné, who was the CEO of Total was, yeah, but you know, we have a competition, we have to make money, so we're gonna continue. And since we have the money and we have the power, 
we are going to continue. So I think your answer, uh, the answer to your question is, is, is right there. We, those people, we have to very politely and, and in a very humane way, get rid of them. <laughs> okay, let's talk about nuclear power for a while. <clears throat> Just to recall a few uh, nuclear features, uh, you know, you've heard about radioactive isotopes, I suppose. You know that uh, there are about uh, 3,000 isotopes. There are only 92 stable, uh, nearly stable elements, but uh, there are 3,000 isotopes. Each element has several isotopes, and those are often radioactive. So radioactivity is important. That's not a surprise. Fission only occurs in very heavy nuclei. For example, uranium and plutonium, of course. This, you may not have realized, some of you, the fission energy is very concentrated because it's around a nucleus, and the nucleus is really very small. But the concentration of energy doesn't mean that the energy isn't high. It's 200 million times more than the en chemical energy. When you break a chemical bond, and when you, when you break a nucleus, the factor between the two is, 200, is about 200 million. So what I'm telling you about is why is nuclear energy interesting? Well, that's one point. It's, it could be one reason. Then there's what's known as the chain reaction. You uh, send a neutron into a, uh, a nucleus, uranium or plutonium. You choose the right isotope. Uranium-235, plutonium-239, and that's the total number of protons plus neutrons. Uh, it breaks up. When it breaks up, it produces various isotopes, but it also will, pr will produce neutrons. Neutrons will be emitted. How many? If there are enough neutrons, for example, two, then those will be available to, break, uh, to produce fission in others, and so on. So you have different generations, in that sense, of, uh, of fissions. After, f after six generations, you have 400 fissions. When you go up to, say, 14 generations, you have a million. And that fission takes place on distances that are of the order of a millimeter. So the energy density is huge. That you have in a nuclear reactor, the core of the, new, of the reactor is at an extremely high temperature, and you have to isolate the, uh, the, the, the core. Extremely high means several thousand degrees. Uh, you have to isolate it from the rest of the reactor, otherwise everything would melt, of course, and they were, you couldn't control anything. So the process is exponential, that's what I've been saying exactly. The reactor, the, 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 the problem, I'd like to, you, to come away with this, uh, this idea, the challenge for a nuclear reactor and the source of all the problems you've heard about in nuclear reactors is that fission requires exquisite control over that exponential, the chain reaction. You want to, you have an exponential process and you would like it to be linear. Linear means the sort of thing we do when we move, uh, when, we, when we react, when we start thinking and we have a problem unexpected, for example, in a nuclear reactor, and we have to react sufficiently fast, but the process is exponential and we are linear. We think one minute or one second after another. And we, so we need to preview, of course. <coughs> preview means you have forecast all possible situations. You see the difficulty. You don't always forecast every problem. The, uh, 
the things that you control are the neutron energy. You can slow down the neutrons in a reactor. You can control the density of the, of the, the, the neutron gas that is going to fission various nuclei. And you uh, try to control the variations. Yes? But by controlling the neutron density... Ah, sorry. <coughs> Shout. Put my other voice in. <laughs> do, do the best you can. But by controlling the neutron density, aren't we actually exerting exponential... Uh, control at the exponential level and not at the linear level when we control the density of neutrons? Because effectively, if you control... If we have two, three, or one f um, neutron resulting from a fission, we're effectively acting over the exponential and not linearly, right? Yeah, sure. So yeah, we, do, we can do act exponentially as well. But th that's what I'm saying. Exactly. The, the, uh, that's the split. You have an exponential process, and we are linear. Ah, linear reasoning. Yeah. All right. Uh, and so we, we, have to, we have to anticipate. And we have to have people and that's, that's one of my main points later on, we have to have people who run these things who are sufficiently clever, trained, highly trained, experienced, and creative. Creative. Because situations due to exponential processes are very often unexpected. Thanks for the question. Good. But what does it look like? I think you, you may have seen this. This is Wikipedia, so don't. Uh, yeah, if you have problems on that, the, uh, the, 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 the this sort of uh, problematic in uh, on Wikipedia is really something that you can rely on pretty often. When it's propaganda, you can see it immediately, but. Uh, much of this is, uh, is very well described by competent people. So this, this is what a reactor looks like. The, the core of the reactor is right inside here. And you have a system in which you, are, you, you, you control the neutron, the number of neutrons, the density of neutrons, and the, uh, the way the, 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 you can act and react on the variations in the neutron number or uh, density. I don't want to go into the details. We can talk about that later if you want, but it's n not my purpose here. And then that's the nuclear part. It's here. And then you have the locomotive. You have, you've, what are you doing? You're boiling water. A nuclear reactor is basically a locomotive. It's a very expensive and complicated locomotive. It boils water in, in the most common nuclear reactors we have. It, uh, it, uh, you have pressurized water or boiling water, depends. And you run a turbine and the turbine produces electrons. The electrons go off and light our light bulbs. Inside, you have a lot of piping. <coughs> the reason why, sorry, I don't know if you see this. Uh, you have a lot of piping inside the reactor, and uh, it's not uninteresting because many of the problems that the reactors have, uh, uh, have had over the 70 years of use of uh, nuclear energy are, just a second, uh, are related to the fact that uh, we're changing where uh, the pipings well let me put it this way water unexpectedly is corrosive and not just on your hands it's also corrosive on on steel pipes and so you have corrosion as a major problem in nuclear reactors there are special steels and very often the problems are solved and when they're not solved you replace the pipes and so forth you stop the reactor you start it again and so forth it costs money it costs energy and so forth but you can you can do it rather simply 
those are not nuclear problems, but the fact that they're there has a major effect on the structure of the nuclear reactor itself because those pipes run through the reactor. And so they change the way in which you can control the neutron density and so forth. So these things all interact. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I have a question. So what always seems strange to me is that we have come so far to control uh, complex chain reactions on a uh, tiny scale, but somehow we haven't come up with a more effective way to produce energy than by making things turn. Um, are there any alternatives or is it, I don't know, is there too little research done on that or <laughs> I don't understand. <coughs> I think you understand very well. I mean, your, 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 your question and your suggestion are exactly the problem. We're the, I'm, I'm going to go into nuclear history. We'll talk about it in a minute, but it, it's the topic. Uh, just to give you an idea, very, uh, very general idea of uh, what, the, what nuclear energy implies, which is not just a nuclear reactor. The uh, nuclear reactor is, uh, where is it? It's here. It's only one part of the, uh, you have to produce uranium, you mine it, you mill it, you enrich, you have to enrich in, uh, yes? There are some types of reactors that not require enrichment, right? Oh, right. <coughs> Do all reactors require enrichment? You're very good at that. <laughs> I used to do the theater. <laughs> uh, yes. Some, re some need more than others. But you always need to increase. The, uh, the natural content of uh, uranium-235, which is the uh, fissile uh, isotope, is 0.7%. And you need at least 3 or 4% uh, to to uh, have a neutron number and a neutron density uh, that's sufficient to run the reactor. So you always have a certain degree of enrichment. And to anticipate, let me tell you that uh, the main place to enrich uranium for the whole world is Russia. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so you enrich. You make your fuel, you put it in the reactor, and then it's every, it depends, between two and four years, you have to take the, uh, the core of the reactor out and replace it by another core. Not because it's depleted in uranium-235, but because other isotopes have been produced that po poison, quote and unquote, the, uh, the nuclear reactor and make it more difficult to run. So it, this, this change is absolutely obligatory. And what do you do with them? In those, uh, in, in, in those elements that you've taken out, you have radioactive uh, isotopes, and some of them are very long-lived. If they're short-lived, they're usually very intensive because when they they are short-lived, you produce many more. When they are long-lived, you produce less. The danger is not necessarily related to the lifetime. But of course, if, they, if, if it's very intense, you want to protect yourself. So you have to have a pool in which you protect them. You protect yourself, rather, by putting them in a, in a huge pool of water. I'll show you a pool in a minute. Uh, and then the spent uh, uranium, you can, in France particularly, it's not done uh, elsewhere except in Russia and to some extent in Japan. Japan has been trying to do it, has failed so far. So basically it's France and Russia who do what's known as reprocessing because most of the uranium has not been uh, is, is not, uh, has not been used, used up in, uh, to, to fission. It's still in there. So you want to get it out again to, to, to reprocess it and put it back in and go around. 
what I'm trying to drive at is this is an industry. It is not an individual nuclear reactor in a corner and then like uh, you turn on the gas because you have, uh, you, you have a cooking machine and you, uh, uh, everything is on site. No, here in France, for example, this is in the southeast. This is in, 50, is in uh, 19 different places all along the coast and along the River Loire. This is the pools are next to the reactors, but there's also a site, a special site in Normandy, in a place that used to be one of the most beautiful places in the world that now has a huge uh, system of, uh, of uh, uh, reprocessing and enormous pools. And, uh, and the, uh, this is in the southeast. So it's all over. And in the United States, uh, you have about 100 sites that, uh, that run over all this, uh, all this process. So do not think that uh, nuclear industry is something that's very concentrated. It is in various places. And of course, between all these places, you have transport. And you have transport of highly radioactive material that has to be protected in two ways. Im immediate protection for, for the safety of those who do the work and uh, protection against terrorism, accidents, so forth. Sorry. This is what it, a reactor core being transported from uh, Japan to France or from France to Japan, for example. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the size of the thing. It's not something you, you put in your pocket. There's a smaller one up there. You have, the, you have the people next to it so you get an idea of the size. Sorry. This is what the pool I was talking about looks like. You have each of these things is a reactor core being cooled in uh, La Hague in Normandy. So you see that this is something that is not uh, particularly small, nor easy, nor, uh, nor trivial to, uh, to manipulate and so forth. These engines are absolutely huge. This thing weighs about uh, I think uh, 16 tons each. So uh, it's uh, not that simple. The capacity of these things, of this one, it's the only one we have in France. Its capacity is about 16,000 tons. The filling so far is, so far is 14,000 tons. And every year we add 200 tons. So you realize that we're getting to the point in France where uh, either we build a second pool, which is 10 years work, 10 years to do it in a, so that it, it, it can really work like this one, or we stop producing. Yes? <clears throat> Very quick question. The pools are only for disposal, or is it expected that the cores are going to leave them eventually? Are going to be what? Uh, it leave the pools eventually. They're there forever? Or no. They're, or it's part of no, the they're, 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 there for, uh, they're there for four or five years to, uh, to cool down. Some maybe may take longer. It depends on the reactor and so forth. And uh, they're replaced by the, uh, by the others. But since each reactor core uh, lasts at most four years in a reactor, uh, you see that it, ke it keeps on circulating. So it's, it's always, uh, the number is, is constant. 
Uh, don't worry about the, this complicated thing. All I wanted to show you was the situation for France, energy in and out. Uh, <coughs> this is this is coal, coal, oil, gas, nuclear energy, and hydro. The uh, the uh, the main idea is that the fossils are seventy five percent. They represent seventy five percent of the energy that's ultimately used. Nuclear is twenty five percent of electricity, which itself is about twenty percent. So <clears throat> the, uh, the proportion in, uh, of the total is uh, relatively small, and this is true, of course, in the United States as well and in Russia. So the uh, nuclear is not a very large contributor to, uh, to, 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 to the world's uh, use of energy. And uh, that is contradictory to what people imagined in the 60s, of course, when uh, the idea was that it was going to feed the whole, the whole world. Now, the point I want to make is that there's a difference between the energy you put in, the initial energy, how much energy you can calculate if you take, uh, if you take a, a certain amount of oil or a certain amount of gas, you can calculate how much energy, total energy, you can get out of it. And then there's the energy you end up with. And those two numbers are necessarily different because uh, uh, you don't gain, you lose. For nuclear, there's a special case. It's true for the others. Uh, part of the energy goes away because uh, you have losses. And uh, <coughs> for, for various reasons, things uh, escape in the air and so forth when you burn them. In nuclear energy, there's a special case, which comes back to a question that we had before, which is uh, we use nuclear energy basically to boil water. That's the part we're using for its thermodynamics. And the best, uh, the best rendement, hmm? yield, thank you. Uh, the best yield you can get, <laughs> uh, the best yield you can get out for a thermodynamic system is about 35 percent, and the rest is lost. So you can say, we can make a heater, we can use it to heat, and initially, we'll come back to that. Some some were used for that, but it's not the same reactor. So. You have to develop a special reactor to do both. And so far, there is none. And we're 70 years after the beginning. But aren't, um, <coughs> isn't energy generated by coal and oil and gas also used to boil water? In the thermal power plants, that they, they also work by yeah. boiling water? And well, a, a, a car, uh, the motor of a car has a yield of about 30%. So this is not just electricity produced, it's also... No, what I'm saying is that nuclear, it, from that point, from the point of view of yield, for all the rest it's very different. From the point of view of yield, the, to the type of reactor we have is in the same class as all the others. Okay. Then wouldn't they also need a... A big arrow upwards for coal or uh, for coal oil and gas. Wouldn't they also have a loss rate of around? Uh, but, well, it it depends on the way you use it. It depends how you how you use it. If you're uh, I can't think of a good example. Sorry, but. Uh, you, you obviously have lo losses. I mean, you can see it on the you can see it on the graph. But uh, no, but I think basically, if you're talking about once you've finished using it, and you come back and look at how you use it and so forth, you're probably right. Uh, we're in the same we're in the same class for any system that ends up being thermodynamic is going to have that sort of yield. 
And that's one of the things I wanted to mention. After all, you're supposed to be economists, so you, you, can, uh, you can follow this, uh, this sort of uh, graph. A very interesting notion is the energy you receive and compared to the energy, the, the ultimate energy received compared to the energy that you put in. What I said is you calculate, you have a, you have a cup of, uh, of oil or gas and you calculate the, the energy and then you use it and you end up asking how much of that, the initial energy you really got at the end. And when you do that for, uh, for nuclear energy, you, this is the negative part, this is the positive part. You see that that's <coughs> the energy, the, the, the construction requires a certain amount of energy that comes off the total energy that you've produced. You have to subtract it. These are, the, these are economic numbers. They're not, uh, I'm not talking about what happens in the machine. Uh, that's the energy produced. You've lost, from a market point of view, the energy you consume to, to get it, put it together. Then there's the energy that you send to the consumer, but the, uh, after a while, the reactor has lived its life. You have waste conditioning. You have to clean up. You have to cool it in safe storage. The, uh, the swimming pool I showed you before, you dismantle and so forth, and you end up with a net energy production that is definitely lower than the energy that you would put in expect. Now, just a second, I don't want to finish this. Uh, here is a comparison for various energies, oil, gas, coal, and so forth. As you can see, oil and gas are quite efficient, 85%. The Eroe is between 13 for oil, 15 for gas, and 80 for coal. Coal is very, very interesting, very useful, <coughs> simply because it's very rustic. You have very, very little treatment. Hydroelectricity is even better. The efficiency is nearly 100% and the Eroe is 102. Wind, solar and so forth. It's not fantastic today. It's between 5 and 20. And fracking is even worse, besides the dangers. Nuclear has an efficiency we talked about, and the Eroi is between 4 and 15, which is not that different, as you can see, from wind and solar. So a question that will come in is for the future is, can we build reactors that are better than, from that point of view? But you've seen the cycle of work that has to be done for a nuclear reactor, and it's not obvious. Sorry. <clears throat> On the previous graph, um, it suggests that the energy costs for uh, on the previous graph, um, the one before, exactly. It suggests that in the phase three, um, that the end of the project is after 150 years. But I, if I remember correctly, then like high-level radioactive waste can be dangerous for a human contact to up to 100,000 years. So I'm wondering if after these 150 years at the final disposal, there is nothing to be done anymore, or if you not have to at least send one person every couple of years to check if anything is leaking, or I don't know. Well, <coughs> you don't know because nobody knows. Uh, the, 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 the problem of, uh, of nuclear waste is simply not solved. I mean, you can you can decide. It's not just a matter of uh, it's not just a matter of uh, lifetimes. I think the uh, the, the discussion around uh, nuclear waste. I don't want to go into that uh, 
right now, but uh, the, the, uh, it's not just a matter of how long it lives. It's, it's a matter of how much you, uh, how radioactive it is. If it's very long lived, it's less radioactive than when it's short lived. So the, uh, there's a compromise there. Basically, uh, the, uh, the, the interesting point that we should emphasize is time, memory. <laughs> if it lives 10,000 years, we have no idea of who's going to be around, if anybody, uh, at, at that time to, uh, to look into it and do something about it and so forth. Uh, the, the problem of waste is not a very long-term problem in the sense that you need to solve it over a rather short time, say be less than 300 years basically, because of the, in, the intensity, the intensity, not the lifetime. You have, you, the lifetime, you can, you can also find processes to, 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 uh, to eliminate some of them and so forth. There, there are, the, the problem is very complicated, that's why you hear me waffling around. The, the, uh, basically, the answer to your question is, uh, do we have, I'll, I'll take the question and turn it around, do we have a way of controlling uh, waste? And the answer is no. That's the that's the short. Just my point is whether this back end energy debt is underestimated. Then, if they only look to up to one hundred fifty years. No, because uh, either you've solved it in that short time, or you ha you uh, you you've put it underground and forget about it. So economically, you don't worry about it. And part of the French solution uh, to the problem is treating it like that, saying if we put it in the ground for a hundred years, we're going to look and check it and so forth, have people going around and me measuring things and so forth. And after that, if nothing is moved, we put a lot of concrete and we forget about it. But that's not said. It's, it's just, sorry. Mm -hmm. Ten years time, nuclear fusion will be on. Please your shout. Saying, do you think that in ten years time, fusion will be on your chart? No. No. Why <laughs> so? For, uh, well, I'll give you a very short answer. Uh, fusion is putting the sun in a bottle. Okay, basically that's what we want to do. We want to put the sun in the bottle. What's the bottle made of? People have worried a lot about how to make the sun, how to develop the plasma and so forth. And from a point of view of basic science, it's fascinating. It's very important for basic research. But once you, use, once you make the plasma, besides the fact that it has to be stable and so forth, and that's good. And that's what people have studied, and they're, they're getting success, successful in that, uh, in that area. Once you've done that, it produces neutrons like hell. It produces, in a matter, just to give you an idea, in a matter of about 10 seconds, it produces the amount of neutrons that these reactors produce in 40 years. Nobody knows what material is going to resist. So having these things all over the place, uh, uh, well, it's a personal opinion. But. I have also a question. <laughs> because the solution with the underground, uh, putting all the waste underground, I just discussed with someone in the ministry, I won't disclose who, but he said, even in the places we found uh, the East of France for that, I mean, within a few thousands of years, they know that it will go out of the ground. It won't stay there. Well, yeah. I mean, the, 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 uh, what I've heard from, 
when you when you talk to ge geologists they tell you that the different uh, types of uh, of um, rocks in which the, uh, these things can be put uh, are very different and they behave differently and so forth and there are pr uh, you you can't uh, you can't just say we buried any anywhere and so forth so they they're scientists they they, they realize that it's going to there'll be an evolution but they're scientists who reason over a thousand years or at least and usually more than like a million years uh, when you talk to the people who have have the problem they're not the nuclear physicists they're economists who work and 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 who uh, direct the uh, direct the uh, direct the work and they reason in terms of money and what they say is in 300 years everybody will have forgotten about it somebody will find a solution and for nuclear energy there are several problems for which the attitude has been like that which is not very not very reasonable okay some nuclear history I have no idea what, the, what time it is but we're, we're mixing I'm giving you some, some nuclear history for a, for a few minutes nuclear power troubled birth loaded history I don't think I have to go into very many details clearly World War II had a, a, a huge impact because of the Manhattan Project let me remind you that the, man, the, the purpose of the Manhattan Project was to make plutonium for the bomb and the, the nuclear reactors that produced those were not at all nuclear reactors that could produce energy they they ate up a huge amount of energy the biggest dam in the world was the Hoover Dam in uh, on the Colorado River in uh, Northwest uh, US and all the energy from the dam was used by two reactors to produce the uh, to produce the plutonium so th there's no relation between those but of course the scientists who in initially developed these reactors uh, gained a lot of uh, scientific information on what nuclear reactors could could be like in building these things so from a scientific point of view there was a, a marginal aspect that later became much more important but for, at that time nobody knew how to produce energy no power these two points are particularly important between 1944 and 1946 every power reactor concept that is known today was invented in two years because of the experience gained by that and the fact that the people who were working on these were some of the best physicists in the world and they were really very clever uh, a bunch of them got Nobel Prizes and so forth so all the concepts that we talk about today including the so-called concepts for the future nuclear future they were all invented there from a sci basic scientific point of view there is nothing new nothing technologically everything has changed from a point basic point of view nothing has changed the so-called light water reactor which is essentially the, the one we we have all over the world now uh, pressurized water reactors uh, it was the first one that was invented at that time the uh, the patent for that reactor was taken out in 1944 in 1946 because they'd invented all these things in the lab these because they produced plutonium was being produced Los Alamos was being uh, was developing the bomb itself and uh, in area in there were 130 sites for the Manhattan Project not everything was at Los Alamos if you've seen the film Oppenheimer <laughs> miserable and if you uh, 
uh, we can talk about it later if you want. The, uh, the idea that you get is everything happened at Los Alamos. That is absolutely not true. There were 130 sites, and there were three or four main ones, and in one of the others, there were people working on reactor designs, developing those designs, and building model reactors on lab scale. These things that produce energies between, say, about 10 kilowatts and a few megawatts, even up to 20 or 30 megawatts. Those were built in a desert in Idaho, but directed by the people in, uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, there were 19 completely different types. There was the light water reactor. There were uh, breeder reactors, which produce as much plutonium as they eat up, a completely different type from the ones we know today, the ones we use today. And there were others that worked with uh, liquids, gases, uh, liquid salts, uh, high, energy, high temperature, low temperature, 19 completely different reactors. All the concepts were being tested. They were not just uh, designs on the table. They were being tested. Very early tests. But do they work? And the answer was the 19s work. They work more or less easily, but they work. Safety was not a problem because this was being done on a lab scale. People were, the people who were doing the work were the people who had invented everything. So they were careful. They didn't want to be irradiated. So they, 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 small is beautiful. You uh, make these things very carefully and you stay away from them to not get irradiated, we'll think about safety differently. It's not industrial, we're, do, we're working in a lab. In 1949, there was a committee that was counseling the uh, Atomic Energy Commission of the US. It was chaired by uh, Oppenheimer, and uh, it had uh, some four or five uh, remarkable, remarkably clever physicists and lucid physicists. They gave a conclusion to the AEC that was the fact that you're asking us whether we can implement nuclear energy on an industrial scale. The answer today is no. We need 15 to 20 years of research, technological research, not necessarily very basic research, but technological research is much more complex uh, than uh, basic research in a sense, because you're faced with different types of, uh, of systems, you're mixing different systems, you can't separate them out to study them separately as you would do in a lab and so forth. So technological research is long and difficult and complicated. And it's not the same people, it's more engineers rather than f basic physicists. You need 10 or 15 years of R&D to judge the feasibility and acceptability of civilian nuclear energy. And the, uh, the question is, as you'll see in a minute, do we have those? In 1951, the US Navy asked uh, an engineer, uh, a, a, a Navy captain who had gone to an engineering uh, uh, an engineering site at Oak Ridge to learn about nuclear reactors. They asked him to choose a reactor because they wanted to put a motor inside a submarine. That's a good idea if you're a, if you're a, Navy, uh, a Navy person because if you, if you have a motor that doesn't need to replenish the gasoline in it, it uh, the submarine doesn't have to come out and be visible and be shut down. And so it will stay under the water and it can stay for a year, two years. And you can, if you can, producing oxygen via the nuclear reactor, the energy of the nuclear reactor itself, it's basically a motor, a nuclear motor. It's on paper, it's something that's relatively simple, but it had never been done. And it was going to take a number of years 
to, uh, to develop. And they chose, in order to do that, the, the, the guy who was responsible, called Mr. Rickover, Admiral Rickover, future Admiral Rickover, chose <coughs> the simplest reactor, a rather crude, rustic reactor, which was the light water reactor, simply because it was the simplest one. Those were the reactors that were being developed and that were all candidates, all the nice apples, the red apples. The green apples are the ones that were not developed. All these were built and beginning to test between 1944 and 1946. And what Rickover did was to choose one of those apples. But the others were there. And the ideas were there. Now, some, the second step is Cold War politics. Uh, just a reminder, because you weren't around when it happened. Uh, the atomic bomb, the Russian atomic bomb, the Soviet atomic bomb, was developed in, by 1949. There was the Korean War until 1953, between 1950 and 1953. There was this naval, Navy program being developed for the submarine, which was developing rather nicely. There were also peace movements all over the world. And there were Cold War strategies of uh, the leaders, particularly the United States and the Soviet Union. And one, at that time, in around 1953, those peace movements were very strong. And the uh, White House was developing strategies which tried to convince the American people that they were trying to convince them of two contradictory things. One was atomic energy is fantastic. We have to develop it. And atomic energy is made a priority for bombs and to defend the country. And it's hard to convince people that it's wonderful and that it's a bomb at the same time. So they were navigating between that. The same was probably true in the Soviet Union, but as you know, the politics in the Soviet Union was such that people just didn't have much choice. In 1953, Eisenhower gave a talk, not a talk, he gave a speech at the end of 1953 at the United Nations, and he offered atoms to the world. He said, we're going to lift the secrets of atomic energy, everything that we've kept secret in the Manhattan Project, <clears throat> not how to make bombs, but the basics. We're going to uh, publish everything, and that's one thing. Second thing, we're going to uh, give nuclear reactors to people who need to make uh, radioactive isotopes for medical use. That was the other good thing. And the third thing, which sounded very good, was we're going to offer nuclear reactors to produce energy to all the countries who are going to request it. That was his speech. When he got back to Washington, his uh, science counselors told him, we have a problem. There's no reactor working that will produce uh, an electrical energy. We don't have any. There's no such thing. So he, he did what a, a politician does. He said, manage, do it. If you need money, we'll put money, do it. In the States, the special, pro the special facet of the States is that everything was built by industry. It's not like in French, where you had the French AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, developing reactors inside uh, with state money and so forth. In the States, it's industry, and the government pays industry when it's building uh, reactors for the atomic bomb. But if it's commercial, industry has to manage. Of course, there are subsidies. 
<clears throat> so that's one question. The second question is, if you want industry to build nuclear reactors, if they do that, they won't be doing other things. For the other things they make money in nuclear, with nuclear reactors, is there a market? There was no demand. There's no market. Nobody wanted, was going to buy a nuclear reactor in those years because there was oil, there was gas, there was coal. Nobody wanted nuclear reactors. Then the question is, who builds it? And of course, there's the question, what technology are we going to use? The decision was made because it was a political decision. We need to develop those reactors. What can we do? We take the reactor we know how to, how to make, which is on an industrial scale. We're talking about industry here. The industrials, uh, industrialists said, I will take the reactor we know how to make, which is the reactor for the submarine, will multiply by three all the dimensions of the reactor, so it, it'll produce much more power, and several tens of megawatts. It's, it wasn't huge initially. It was about, uh, I think it was 57 megawatts, which is not a, not, not a huge amount. And uh, we'll do that, and we'll add the necessary uh, pipings and so forth and, uh, and turbines to, to produce the electrons that we, uh, that we need. We'll do that. And in order to do that, they built that. They put it on the ground, took the, the submarine thing, multiplied the dimensions, put that thing on the, on the ground. And they needed a reactor core. And it happened that the Air Force, who was competing with the Navy, had wanted to build an airplane, a nuclear airplane, which is completely crazy at the time. And in, uh, in order to do that, they'd built a nuclear core that happened to be able to be put into the, this oversized submarine reactor. They put all that together, and it worked, which is a tribute to the quality of the engineers who were working on that. And the, uh, the, the reactor worked. It was built at chipping port, and it, uh, it fed electrons into the, uh, into the grid of uh, Pittsburgh. And it was the showcase for the future of nuclear energy as presented by the United States to the world. The other thing that was built at the same time was the military industry and uh, state complex. People going around from the military to industry, from industry to the military during, during fighting periods or in government to direct the Department of Defense, and uh, circling around. In Japan, they gave it a name because they had the same thing in Japan. It was called the nuclear village. And the expression is exactly the, the, the idea. The result of that, this uh, unbalanced system, is that instead of having the thousand reactors that were expected in the world because it was going to be developed wonderfully, they expected a thousand reactors by 1970. There were the maximum number of reactors that have been existing in the world is 455, I think, something like that. And it never, it never went above, and it's going down, except in China. China is a special case. The, uh, from the point of view of safety, there were some discoveries, because, of course, these things had not been completely understood in, in, their, work, in their technological workings in, in detail. And one thing that was unexpected and that happened at uh, Three Mile Island in 1979 was the, core, the, the, the melting of the nuclear reactor core. The same thing happened after at Fukushima. And that is intrinsic to the light water reactor. It's, it's a defect that is built into the reactor. The, build, the reactor is built in, in such a way that you can't avoid that. And the reason why the EPR, the French EPR, is such a huge thing, uh, which uh, 
which is uh, taking so many years and so much money to build and probably has a 50% chance of never working at all, is that uh, they wanted to protect against the melting of the core. And then comes something called Generation 4. Generation 4 is the idea that it's a fantastic idea. It's, uh, okay guys, we, uh, we don't, we haven't been successful. Where did I put it? I want to read something to you. Well, okay, I'll improvise. Uh, Sorry. Ah. No. There were people, experts at the uh, International Atomic, uh, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, who uh, looked reality in the face and said, okay, I'm trying to quote, we have, uh, we've been using for all these years, this is in 2002, for all these years we've been using a type of atomic energy that is de determined by military use and that has intrinsic defects related to the fact that it's a result of uh, this military use. It can't go on like this. We have to come back to the initial uh, re studies of reactors and re reconceive uh, uh, reactor lines, various different reactor lines, and do the research to end up producing uh, viable nuclear reactors that can be industrialized. Because when you're working in in uh, on an industrial scale, you have to have simple things that, that can be managed by people who are not going to face basic problems of the reactor functioning. They can make it work, but they are, they're not on a scale. Uh, they, they, they don't have the training. They don't have the, 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 the attitude of people who are going to be creative in front of a crisis. And if you look at the history of uh, nuclear energy in the intervening years, you realize that what saved the world in a number of, uh, in a number of uh, uh, crises is the fact that the people who were running the reactors were in fact creative. They were in fact good enough to be able to face unexpected situations. That's what saved us at uh, Three Mile Island, and it's also what saved us at uh, Fukushima. You had a question? No? Okay. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so, here's an... Uh, oh, there it is. Sorry. There's a sentence that uh, is in the IAEA report. So, you, you have a situation where the, the nuclear people themselves, the people who IAEA is supposed to promote nuclear energy and in very, very often it's in a situation where it's, it's, it's doing hype. And in this case, it's facing reality and looking at things directly. And here's the answer. So, what did they do? They followed Oppenheimer's advice and started studying. They took, among the 19 <coughs> reactor types I was talking about, they chose uh, three, sometimes you say four, uh, reactor types and decided that the, the, an international consortium, a loose consortium, people discussing with each other and so forth, sharing uh, the sort of energy that's not uh, necessarily uh, 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 economically crucial, uh, 
sharing information on the, on the basic developments, uh, they tried to design a foolproof reactor. <coughs> and since you want to do that on a scale where you can control everything, you make them as small as possible. So you end up with small reactors. And since you have to put in something to make them even more interesting, you say, ah, we are at a point where a new industrial experience is such and the development is such and artificial intelligence will help us. And so we can have these things in modular form. We will have modules in our shops and we will take the modules, put them together, and we will build reactors cheap and plenty and, and put them all over the place. And if the economy needs smaller reactors rather than big reactors, then we will be able to put them. That was the argument. In the States, uh, has there been, has this led in the 20 years since this, uh, this uh, Gen 4 was started, the, the, the push to develop, redevelop nuclear energy, also including the climate change uh, uh, reasons to develop nuclear energy, which doesn't produce uh, greenhouse gases or produces very little greenhouse gases, as you know. Uh, what, has been the, uh, what has been the evolution? To go through this fairly rapidly. The average age of nuclear reactors in the States is 42 years old. It's generally, it was generally considered so far that a reactor should last 40 years at the most, not too much more because of the corrosion problems I mentioned. And more basically, the fact that the pressure vessel, the, ve the vessel, the outer vessel, steel outer vessel, 20 centimeters thick, that is around the reactor uh, to protect it and to protect the outside too, uh, that you can't, you can't go and change. Uh, it's there once and for all. And after 40 years of irradiation uh, by the core of the reactor, uh, it's going to change sufficiently. The, the, the material, the, the irradiation will affect the material in such ways that uh, it's reasonable to, to, to stop the thing and, and, and build another one if you want. Uh, so the average age is now reaching that point. The other thing, there, there have been some built. They're expensive. But the United States is committed to continuing. The SMRs, uh, there was one company that had... Uh, that had a project that had been accepted by the Nuclear Regulation Committee, which is the committee that uh, decides whether the project is safe and reasonable and so forth. It was accepted and so forth in principle, and has, it has been stopped. It was stopped on November 9th, just a few days ago. Uh, it was canceled because it's too expensive and there are delays. It's not easy to build a nuclear reactor. And every time you change something, because of the nonlinearity we were talking about before, the exponential character of the fission and so forth, rather basic reasons. If you change one point in a nuclear reactor, you're going to have to change the design. It's going to affect the design of the entire reactor. It won't necessarily change everything, but it's going to affect all the points, which makes studying these things a long process and building them and testing them also a long process. And the question that comes out then is how do you do research in under the pressure of the market? Because you, you're doing research in conditions where you can't afford to lose money indefinitely, even if you have government help. So they got a grant from the government that went up to $1.4 billion. It, it's not enough. 
Is France an exception? You know the status, I don't have to go into that. The average age is not far from 40, 40 years old. And France has been warned the, uh, by uh, all sorts of institutions that the reactors had to be replaced after 40 years. And nothing was done. Nothing was done on two points. It was not done from the point of view of pursuing studies of possible new reactors. That was done for, to some extent, to a rather large extent actually in the beginning, by the, atomic energy, the French Atomic Energy Commission, the CEA, but putting an emphasis on breeder reactors. I don't, I don't have time to go into that. But there, there were studies, but there were not studies of machines that could be an, increment, an incremental development of existing uh, nuclear reactors, the uh, light water reactors. <coughs> that was one aspect. The second aspect is that in the 80s, uh, the French uh, electricity producer, which was nationalized at the time, was privatized. In, the, in its uh, functioning, it turned, these were the wonderful market years, a globalization and so forth, and the leaders of the uh, electricity uh, production unit turned to finance and stopped anticipating the future. They were polarized on making money. And as you know, uh, the result is that we're getting uh, ADF is practically broke. At the same time, there was no building of reactors. There was no, uh, no anticipation of what was going to come after. The workforce was reduced. The expertise disappeared with the disappearing workforce and people retiring and so forth, and people looking for other, other jobs. And the disappearance of expertise in, in the case of nuclear energy because of the exponential character and so forth, is extremely important. And of course, uh, since we're in a market, we depend on the fluctuations of the energy market. And uh, if uh, gas and oil prices go like that, then in spite of the fact that the uh, French electricity, uh, nuclear electricity was much cheaper, in fact, the prices had to follow the market prices and all those reasons caused uh, economic problems. So the aging problems, technical problems, the result is that the uh, 14 nuclear reactors in 2022 were taken off the grid to, for various types of repairs or uh, refurbishment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there, every 10 years, the, uh, the French reactors are inspected. Just to give you an idea of the work that entail, it entails, you need 5,000 people on average for an inspection like that. It takes more than a year, <coughs> two, <coughs> two years in some cases. The result was the discovery of many aging problems and a special program called the Grand Carénage for 50 billion euros to refurbish the reactors so that they could last longer. The idea being they should last at least 50 years because anyway, we have nothing to replace them. We're in a crisis. We're in a crisis. France is in a crisis. All the nuclear reactors in France were built at the same time. None have been built since. The, uh, uh, the, there are plenty of outages on the reactors simply because they're getting older. Here's an example. This is the running time, the production time for uh, French reactors since the beginning. You see the increase first, which is related to the fact that we're building new reactors and putting them, setting them up. And then with time, the lady gets older or the man gets older. And uh, starts getting rusty and you have to change small things, not necessarily very large, but a stoppage is always, uh, always takes time. And the stoppages that have effectively happened have always 
in 30% of the cases, I think, the stoppages were un, uh, unexpected. They were, they were done in places, in times where it had to be scrammed. It had to be stopped immediately, which of course increases the problems uh, of repair and so forth after that. So we have a looming energy crisis. What are we going to do with that? Can we, can we fill up, fill out the program that uh, Macron has, uh, has decided? <clears throat> it's one thing to decide and it's another to, to produce. The nuclear renaissance, building new reactors, the large reactors, the EPR reactors, and building a fleet of small reactors means that you have a, an industrial base, a workforce, and the competence and intelligent management as well, and possibly a market if you want to, uh, if you want to not lose too much money when you, when you do that. And as a matter of time, how much time do we have? The main ideas are on the, uh, on the presentation there. France, French industry has lost 20% of its strength in the last 15 years, in spite of the fact that the government has subsidized the largest uh, companies uh, to the tune of 156 billion euros, not the small companies. But the industrial base is not just the large companies, which have maintained their, their, their numbers more or less, even when they've been sold to foreign companies. You, ha you need SMEs as well. You need small, uh, small industries, smaller industries that give you <coughs> an industrial fabric. You need about 3,000 uh, industrial companies to contribute to the building of a reactor, to the various facets. For, for the industry, not, not building one reactor, but building a, a, a set of reactors. So it's, it's something that, uh, that requires, you need, a, you need to mobilize uh, a country's industry. <coughs> and we've lost 50% of the workforce going into services. Not always delivering pizzas, but uh, services do not produce nuclear energy. And then as a matter of competence, the result is that uh, the uh, French SMR called Neward is going to be built by the guys who build the nuclear reactors for the submarines in France, because they're the only ones who've kept the competence to build a nuclear reactor. Is this compatible with uh, the urgencies that we're facing? The, reason, the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, as I said, we have 10, 20 years to solve the nuclear energy problem, so uh, uh, keep our reactors working sufficiently long, which means that we have to control them, we have to rebuild part of them, we have to satisfy their, uh, their control, we have to develop the competence of new workers to simply keep the existing nuclear park working and on top of that we're going to build uh, a class of entirely new reactors the EPR2 which is different from EPR1 it's supposed to be an improvement it, it has less uh, uh, less trimmings on it let's say but uh, it's something that we don't know how it's going to be built you need about 20 million hours of studies to de of designs 
to build a reactor, a large reactor, 20 million. So far, for the EPR2, as far as I know, there have been 1 million hours devoted to the design, which means that nobody has any idea of how much the thing will cost in the end and exactly in detail how it's going to be built. And we have this problem of what are we going to do in the next 10 years? And for the SMR, it's the same thing. There have been studies. There are, there's this example of the American uh, New World, uh, case, the French, uh, the uh, New Scale case, which was just stopped. The, the French system is somewhat similar in, in design to, to the, the New Scale thing. It's a pressurized water reactor with all the problems of pressurized water reactors, notably Core, core melting risks, and it's going to take 10 years to build because you need to study the thing, you need to develop the environment around it, you need to develop the protection, you need to develop the, the, uh, the nuclear conditions because these small reactors have to have more highly enriched uranium because you need a certain, a certain amount of neutrons to get your reactor going. So if the reactor is smaller, you have less uranium in it, but you need to have more uranium-235. And so you have to enrich your uranium. <coughs> All these problems are going to result in the fact that there's no time to, to just to be very short and, and brutal summarizing it. We have no time to, to fill out a program like the French nuclear program is being proposed by uh, Macron. And the, the danger of the program is not just losing money, it's losing time and this modifying, adapting, say, in a, in a bad sense of the word, the French industrial base to the development of nuclear energy as opposed to the possibility of preserving the reactors that exist and developing, of course, uh, new renewables, which are on a short time base can be developed very fast. And, and doing the research, and doing the research for new renewables that are more effective, that have a, an ROI that is much larger than the between five and 20 that we've seen before, that are uh, more, uh, more efficient from the point of view of their absolute efficiency in terms of producing energy, that are connected to the grid in, an, in a more intelligent way than it's been done so far. So there's research to do there. It's not very complicated, but it has to be done. Developing new types of solar, possibly wind, but definitely solar that are more effective and that are uh, designed in a way that the material you, the, the material you use, the, uh, the, the primary material that goes in to the, uh, into the solar cells is something that is less costly than the materials that are being used today, except silicon. Ideally, one would like to work with silicon. Silicon is plentiful in, on Earth. The other metals are not that plentiful. So there's work to do. That work requires people, competence, industry, and devoting more energy on that side would be absolutely essential, and that's not what's being done. And we require a discussion in which we study these problems, particularly what's going to be produced, how we're going to change all these aspects, how we, how we can develop, and in France it's absolutely crucial because it's going down the drain, redevelop uh, an intelligent educational system and, uh, and preserve the qualities of the system that we, that we have and get rid of the, the, the negative aspects and develop research. 
That's a program for the future. I'd like to finish with this. I don't think I need to comment on that. I have two questions. Yes. So, I just want to know your opinion and your comments about uh, Macron's visit to Central Asia, Kazakhstan, and oh, Sorry. I, I want to know your opinion. So, um, and uh, so Macron, I mean, the president, he visited Central Asia to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan for, uh, we have some chemicals. I mean, sorry, I got no Yeah, uh, which is like, uh, and Kazakhstan makes up around 40% of the that's supply of uranium. Yeah, uranium, thank you. And, and Uzbekistan as well, not 40%, but less. And uh, how would you comment? I mean, we see a lot of threats, a, lo a lot of things you've just mentioned. And how would you comment on that? And, uh, and next question, my next question is, I want to bring to, to you to 1986 about Chernobyl. So uh, because you have not covered it here, uh, which is very important, I think, um, and how that disaster affected uh, to the reduction of threats in the future, let's say. The reduction of? Threats. 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 Yeah, things happening again and again in the future, let's say. <coughs> no. Uh, re regarding Chernobyl, uh, the, the reason why I didn't mention it was that, uh, as you've noticed, my talk was rather long anyway, so I didn't want to go into, <laughs> into that. But... Uh, the, the, the reason, uh, the, the more basic reason is that the Chernobyl is a reactor that's basically different from the, uh, the reactors we have in the, in the States, in most of Russia, not everywhere, and in, uh, in France, definitely, <coughs> including Kazakhstan. Uh, the reactor type in Chernobyl is uh, very sensitive to, uh, to the possibility of a, a meltdown. It is, it is a basically unstable uh, reactor. It's not just the instability of the fission process itself, it's also the reactor itself that is unstable. And uh, it, it was run for a long time and very, uh, very efficiently by, uh, by competent people who managed it uh, okay. And with, uh, with time, the quality of the people and the, the, their incentive to, uh, to, to, to keep the, the, the level of, uh, of competence very high uh, went down and, and, the and the catastrophe came around. So, Chernobyl is, is, an, is the prime example of how dangerous nuclear energy can be, but it's not, and there are many problems that I would love to go into. Uh, in fact, I could give, I could give a two-hour talk on the, on, on the topic of the effect of Chernobyl on people, because the, uh, Chernobyl has affected a huge population contrary to what uh, the nuclear establishment has, uh, has uh, tried to uh, keep under the rug. And when I say nuclear establishment, I should say uh, essentially government establishments uh, because the, 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 the questions are, go rather deep, including into military aspects. But uh, it's, it's, it's a very different problem. The, the other question, uh, I'm not sure I... I I understand exactly what you're driving at, but what I would say is that why did Macron go to Kazakhstan? Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, he's attempting, as uh, his Russian counterparts and his American counterparts do, he's trying to regroup the people who 
are determined to redevelop nuclear energy from several points of view and not just civilian. The development of uh, military uh, nuclear energy is at least as dependent on civilian energy as civilian energy is dependent on military uh, nuclear energy. It was the, uh, uh, in 1953, just after Eisenhower's uh, speech, uh, the council, the science counselor to, uh, uh, to the Israeli uh, president uh, said there are not two types of nuclear energy. If you develop one, you're developing the other. And you're training people for the other. And the two go together. And the people who develop one are very interested in the other. I'll give you a counterexample. It's pretty clear. Why does Saudi Arabia want to develop nuclear reactors? It's the country that has, in the world that has the most oil. They have oil for a long time if they keep it to themselves. It's not that they're so interested in avoiding climate change. There's a lot of uh, I don't want to go into the politics of the thing. Yeah. So I have um, a question regarding exactly the, the type of reactors that you know, the graphite reactors. So and from I think she was first. Yeah. Okay, but, but go ahead. We will take this question. But, um, particularly regarding graphite reactors. And from the way you presented the history of um, nuclear energy, we mostly moved from the primitive light water reactors to uh, this smaller scale uh, modular approach. Where would we put um, graphite reactor, the, the, the emergence of graphite reactors in the grand scheme of things of, um, of nuclear? The first reactors were graphite reactors. <clears throat> and the, uh, the reason why the uh, the RBMK, uh, Russian reactor, uh, Chernobyl type, uh, was developed was that they wanted to build a reactor. It was a clever idea on paper. They wanted to develop reactors that could both produce plutonium, which is what you do with a, gra a graphite reactor. Uh, the configuration is such that you can get the plutonium out uh, rather easily. Uh, they could produce plutonium and produce energy. In the case of Chernobyl, the, the reactor, which originally probably produced both plutonium and energy, uh, but we don't know about it. But uh, in the latter stages, particularly in the 80s, it was only producing energy. And uh, so the, it, it was. The, the, the idea was to, to iterate from something that we know how to do, and which was the priority, which was getting plutonium, to the production of energy by basically not changing the reactor too much. So it's a, it's a first stage. And then the, the, then the Russians developed uh, essentially the, the, the pressurized water reactor, the, uh, the, the reactor called the VVER, which is also in Kazakhstan is, uh, is a, a light water reactor. Uh, thank you very much for such an interesting and relevant lecture. So my first question would be like, what, uh, what, is, uh, what is French public opinion on nuclear, like development of nuclear energy in France, like taking into account such a long standing experience? And this, I'm asking this because uh, you mentioned nuclear um, energy history uh, during Cold War uh, period and Kazakhstan is a vivid example of such a country where more than like 450 uh, atomic 
bomb tests were conducted both in, in the atmosphere and underground. And for us, it's a very like, controversial topic because we still are facing ecological problems, we're still facing health problems, mutations, like even now, after 60, 70 years. But at the same time, uh, taking into account like the uh, amount of uranium we uh, supply and also um, our uh, like our government wants to come to carbon neutrality uh, and of course uh, regarding the topic that our Ahror already mentioned about the visit of Macron to the Kazakhstan to Kazakhstan because uh, there is a nuclear partnership and French energy supplier EDF uh, wants to construct a nuclear power plant but it will be decided whether it's constructed or not only after the referend referendum like uh, people will decide um, what to do like whether we should construct this power plant or not so my question is what measures what policies should be imposed by for example, our government, also French side, to ensure environmental safety and also societal acceptance. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, regarding regarding policy. Uh, I, I'm not trying to avoid the topic. But the straight answer is, let's come back to what we were talking about at the beginning. We have 10 years and there's climate change. And, and there's an external force that's acting on us. And our reactions to our capacity to adapt to, to the changes that that external force is, is producing is crucial to the, to the survival of our kids and to some of you, the survi your survival. And uh, at least in a society that's uh, reasonably uh, built up. And so going into, well, that, that's what I was saying at the end, go, going into a nuclear industrial, a massive nuclear industrial development at this point is we don't have the time to do it. We don't have the means to do it industrially. Industrially, at least in, in, in France, the Russians do. I'll come back to that. Uh, and there's no market for the, uh, uh, for the SMR to be, uh, to be a rational uh, market object. You would have to, have, uh, you would have to be able to sell sell about 2,000, it's been evaluated by economists, of the order of 2,000 SMRs. Can you imagine a world with SMRs all over the place? Nuclear uh, cores traveling from one place to another, people, uh, and, and, uh, and the waste, the waste per kilogram for a, an SMR is exactly the same as the waste per kilogram for a large nuclear reactor. So there's no gain from that point of view. And it, it, it's, it's not the world we can, we can't live in a world like that. We don't, it's not feasible and who wants it? So uh, that, that's. Very last question maybe there. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, so I'm wondering, um, so as, as it appears to me, and this is not very, um, very surprising, the, the way to go about climate change is not through nuclear energy build up. However, at the moment to, to take immediate action, to recognize this urgency, we have a big fraction of people that do not recognize climate change as a problem to begin with. We have, and I feel like um, in Germany not so much, but I feel like in Germany we are in a bit of a bubble when it comes to nuclear energy. Uh, public opinion, people that do recognize that there is climate change and do recognize that we have to do something, largely want nuclear to be the option to go because they have the huge 
advantage that the energy density is very high, so you don't have to plaster large percents of the landscapes with uh, renewable energies. Um, but looking at your presentation, at least, I think there is lots of arguments that are easy, understand, easy to understand and that are quite convincing. And these arguments have been there for a long time. First of all, why do you think people don't respond to arguments like these? And on which platform do you think would it be best to have a discussion, to present arguments and to discuss how to go forward? If you have an opinion on that. Um, and just before you answer, I make a very, very short comment because, um, I mean, I, I have a friend that was uh, 30 years ago the head of the nuclear security plant in, in France, in ADF. And I discussed with him 20 years ago, and we discussed about the security of power plants. And so he explained me, because he was also the head of the power plant at one point, and how bricolage it was, I mean, we, we had to change things because we discovered that something w didn't work so well and, and sometimes we, we were afraid about what happened, so very creative, uh, as you mentioned. And I tried to discuss with him whether um, we can do nuclear plants uh, in a secure way, in a safe way. And he's an engineer, I mean, the heart of France for nuclear plants, and he, he's really convinced that we can do uh, in a safe way. And I tried to, to, to convince him that it was not the case and it was very difficult. But at one point I managed to, to put him in real difficulty in his, his argument. And the argument was about the market and the pressure of the market. Because now, contrary to what happened maybe 40 or 50 years ago, almost everything has been privatized and you have now a cascade of subcontractors in the, in the field. And he, he, he told me, okay, you're right, we cannot do uh, safe nuclear plants with a cascade of subcontractors. And I told him, okay, let's write a statement about that in the newspaper. I did not convince him. <laughs> what should I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, you had an answer, uh, you had the question there, but I don't know if you want to, no, you had, you had the question, but, but if, if you want to make oh. a comment, I don't know if you want to. Uh, well, you you don't need the mic. No, I, I can keep the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Your last and final uh, words. Try to say several things. Uh, first. We must, and not, not just for <coughs> the abstract interest of uh, science, we must answer Oppenheimer's question. Uh, research has to be done for the time necessary, but it's research, it's technological research, it's not industrial implanta implementation. Research has to be done to find out whether it's possible to design a reactor that has two main features. One is uh, safety and uh, intrinsic safety so that there cannot be an accident. And the other is nuclear energy does not make sense if you're just using uranium-235. The only reasonable way to use nuclear energy is to use the total amount of uh, uranium or plutonium once you have it in a reactor and use it in such a way that you use the entirety of the thing. It's possible, it's a, it's a so-called breeder reactor. The breeder reactor is sort of the nuclear horizon People have been dreaming about making it. It's been tried in the, in the US. They tried it for many years. The first reactor that produced electricity was a breeder reactor. So technically, uh, intrinsically, it's possible 
to produce electrons. But producing electrons industrially is another business, safely and in such a way that you can do it in, in an industrial process that is simple and run by people who are not experts, but who are simply competent to run an industrial operation. That is the dream. Is this dream possible? We do not know. If it's impossible, we have to find an answer. If, if the answer is that, no, you can't make a perfect reactor that will, uh, that will work indefinitely, then we know that we do not have, contrary to the dream of the initiators of nuclear energy, we do not have an ideal system that will produce energy indefinitely. It's not possible. If it's not possible, then we know why we stop. That's research. That has to be done. On what scale? I don't know, but it's one of the activities that is legitimate. Okay, so let's do it part-time. The main time. The main time is let's solve quickly the problem we have today. And then, uh, what was the, the beginning of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, On which platform should we have this discussion? Uh, or how do we convince people to do that? Yeah, I, I completely agree with, uh, with what you said about the uncertainties of, in people's minds and so forth. Uh, in fact, you will often hear people who, who've been fighting against uh, nuclear energy, particularly in Germany, who've been fighting for many years in an intelligent way, uh, more, more competent than in many other countries, including France, uh, explaining why nuclear energy was not the solution to many problems. <coughs> the, uh, the, the fact that it's very hard to convince people in an environment, uh, let me put it this way, you're, you're, in a, you're in a boxing ring, okay? And you have, uh, you have an opponent who not, o not only does he have a better coach than you, but he has 10 people providing equipment that can destroy you who are trying to explain something. It's exactly the system of a capitalist society that wants to pursue uh, the last stages of capitalism that we know today and want to continue, like Mr. Pouyanné in front of Jean Jouzel, explaining that, of course, I'm I'm, my business is to make money. I have com competition. I have to develop a new oil uh, exploitation system. We're facing that. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, is something that's called uh, Psychologists call it, or, or psychoanalysts call it, deliberate blindness. We want fast solutions. The fact that solutions are fast, are, are impossible, does not mean that we don't idealize them. We have many examples of that. And if you uh, spend your day uh, looking at your uh, Instagram and uh, and... and TikToks and so forth, or, or look at your cousins or kids doing the same, you realize that people are, are drawn to what's easy to, to solve, apparently easy to solve. And the, the, the fight is, that, that's what you've heard and that's why it takes such a long time. Uh, the fight is to bring things down to the ground, show that the problems are not highly intrinsically technical and you should forget about them. Because if you look at a problem as intrinsically technical, you want to forget about it because there are other people who are competent for that. And then you end up saying, okay, we have a problem with climate change. There's a huge a fantastic technical way to get rid of it, Mr. So-and-so will take care of it. 
if we can bring the discussion down to the ground and get citizens realizing that the problem is not a problem of energy production per se, it's a problem of what society needs what energy in how much time. That is a problem that can be discussed by people who are not specialists in nuclear energy, but who are specialists in society because they're citizens. They have an experience. We had this extraordinary time in France, the Gilets Jaunes, you've probably heard of that, I, I suppose, the yellow jackets, people going on, on, on crossroads and getting together and starting to talk and discuss and so forth, and suddenly thinking that they were changing the world simply because they were realizing that they were facing real problems that were their problems, but instead of transferring them, saying the government hasn't done this or that, taking them for themselves and saying, we have a solution, we have ideas. They may not be the best ideas, but together we can put those ideas together and with the appropriate experts and so forth, we can together we can make something work. It's called democracy. I think it's a very good last word. <laughs> Thank you very much. And congratulations to you.